We are now recording, which is great. And Chris, I'm going to send it over to you. You just have to unmute. Perfect. Okay, so I'm talking to you from uh, down in the Pine Barrens in, in Manchester, and uh, um, I, I've given programs all over the place, but I got to confess, I was a little bit nervous because it's, although I've participated in Zoom meetings, I've never given a program, but so far, everything's working well. So what's in store tonight is uh, anybody who knows me knows I have kind of a quirky sense of humor. And that came through in my teaching. Uh, I always found that uh, I could um, transfer information uh, better when it went a little lighthearted rather than dead serious. So you're going to see probably some of that. It's maybe a little bit different than the kinds of shows you've seen, uh, seen in the past. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the process, how names are, are developed. We're going to talk about some anomalies in, in naming and, uh, and hopefully have some fun with this. So, um, and I'm going to talk a lot. So uh, strap yourselves in. Here we go. Okay, so how do we... There we go. Okay, so uh, most of us start out nature study just learning the names of things. And um, after a while we get, you know, a little bit more interested in it and look out for, look for some of the uh, inside information on the plants, animals that we're, that we're looking at, aside from just putting a name on it and checking it off on a list. So as you know, from nature study, there's a lot of really strange names out there um butter and eggs and nut hatch and things like that um and we're going to look at not each and every one of those but we're going to look at some of the ways that uh, that things got their names so uh here we go can i get rid of this thing on the side here or is that the we've got chris we've got a full screen of your program oh you do okay then I, that, that's fine. I see you and Thomas and me on the screen. Uh, so that's fine. It can stay up there as long as you can see the whole screen. So um, I haven't given this program for quite a while. As you imagine, COVID's put a, put a dent in all this kind of thing. Uh, so I'm not a scientist, nor do I play one on TV. I've never studied Latin or ancient Greek, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, I have uh, all the photos are mine, uh, although I have pirated some graphics. And the last two things there had to do with live presentations, where you know, my best teacher stare at people with their phones ringing and stuff like that. So, um, old Chinese proverb wisdom begins by putting the right name on a thing. And that's just the beginning. As you know, uh, nature study is, is, is rich in lore. Uh, history, legend, um, all sorts of things go into uh, to nature. So if you just check down names on a list, you're missing a lot of the fun of, and that's, believe me, that's fun too, but you're missing a lot of the fun of getting some insight on, uh, on nature study. So here we go. Biology 101, this is like uh, sophomore year biology. Uh, Every living thing is placed in a hierarchy from kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, we all know that. The, so the science of uh, putting the organisms into this hierarchy is called taxonomy. And it often seems like fitting square pegs into round holes, sometimes forcibly. Um, I think that this is what they think that we think that they want to look like. And sometimes I think this is what it seems like they're doing uh, when they go around changing species that we've loved for so long. So let's look at how this works. And I've used an old friend, Woody Woodpecker. Kids don't even know who that is nowadays. But uh, 
you know, the kingdom animalia, you got five choices there. Uh, phylum chordata, you have eight choices there. Class uh, alves, you have seven choices. Order picifermes, you have 27 choices. Family picidae, nine choices. And then we go down to genus dryocopus, that's like pileated woodpecker. Cleaver of trees is the meaning there. And there's four among North American woodpeckers. And I just gave him a species name of Walter Lanzii of, uh, of the, uh, the cartoonist uh, that used to draw that. So Woody Woodpecker is Dryocopus Walter Lanzari. Oh, and since I knew my audience, I threw in some, most of this is gonna be about birds because it's what I'm most interested in, but I've, I've also included some, some uh, butterflies and things too. Uh, so we have those, topics, all of those order, family, genus, but we also have finer divisions within there, super families, super uh, genuses and things. So order Lepidoptera, there's two uh, super family Papillona, Papillonoidea, and two families within that, Papillonidae and family Nymphalidae. Um, and a couple of members of, of each. And I'm certainly not going to teach you guys anything about butterflies because I'm a mere babe in the woods with that stuff. Um, I know the big pretty ones and have a whole lot of trouble uh, differentiating the, the smaller ones with finer markings. Uh, and then there's also subspecies. So we have, for instance, peregrine falcon, uh, used to be called uh, in some circles a duck hawk, and it's Falco peregrinus anatum. Uh, all the peregrine falcons all around the world are Falco peregrinus, but they belong to different subspecies. And ours is anatum, which means duck. So that's where the duck, uh, duck hawk thing comes from. Another one is grizzly bear. Used to be called Ursus horribilis. Uh, and then some years ago, they lumped it in with the uh, Eurasian brown bear, Ursus arctos. And when that happens, the species that got named first gets uh, uh, precedence. And so it became Ursus arctos and our grizzly bears uh, is that Ursus arctos horribilis is the subspecies. Some species are split back in the early 1970s, trails flycatcher was split between alder and willow flycatchers. So that gave us two species instead of one. Some species are lumped together. Blue goose and snow goose used to be two separate species. And then years, some years ago, they lumped those together and then they threw them in another uh, genus, the same with uh, white fronted geese and, and uh, uh, gray leg geese, answer. And so blue goose was Chen Carolessens. And for some reason, that must have been named first because that got precedence. So the species name when they got lumped together was now uh, answer Carolessens and blue goose is um, Carolessens, Carolessens and snow goose's carolescence hyperborea. And then there's this. Years ago, Thayer's gull was classified as a subspecies of herring gull. Then it was split into its own species. Uh, Tom was watching here. This, uh, I was with Tom when I took that species, took that picture up in Churchill. Um, and then they reconsidered and now it's considered a subspecies of the Iceland gull. And that's just somewhat confusing to people. Birders hate lumps. And if you remember Lord of the Rings and, and uh, Boromir, uh, one does not simply walk into a room of birders and change their lists. But Birders love splits, another bird on the list. Well, let me just go back. Uh, and just, so, I mean, there's a lot of talk about science in the news these days and everything with COVID and 
you know, birders get ticked off when they take away a species and mess up and put things in different uh, family groups and things like that and genuses. Uh, but science is ever evolving. So uh, uh, wherever the science leads, you know, science is never absolute. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's never, let me say, settled. Uh, there's always more research and more research means maybe uh, making decisions that people won't like, but uh, that's the way scientists work. So when I used to teach history in school we, and I taught European history, we came up to a, an area in the, in, the, uh, in the late Middle Ages and uh, I went through a little lesson plan there. And especially since I was interested in uh, genealogy too, about where family names came from. Uh, and there's basically, and this, well, these four categories pretty much work throughout the world, uh, Chinese, uh, or Asian languages, European languages, patronymic of father's name, like Johnson Robertson, location where somebody's family came from way back when, occupation, Baker, Taylor, Carpenter, epithet, uh, a name, a nickname, some kind of thing, long, short, stout, whatnot. Uh, <laughs> I had some kids in middle school and I, you know, their name, for instance, was Carpenter. So, well, you know, somewhere in your family history, somebody was probably a carpenter. Well, my father's not a carpenter. He's a stockbroker. Well, okay, you don't get it. It's what happened back in, you know, the late 1300s, early 1400s, around that period of time, when somebody wrote a name down in a book. So that's how people's family names come about. And uh, nature is not a whole lot different. Origins of specific names. So I'm going to, I'm going to, this, uh, being a person who taught history, I'm really interested in, in some of this. So, for instance, uh, Wilson's Plover is named for Alexander Wilson, who's known as the father of American ornithology. Now, I don't know how many people know or are aware, there are people who are aware of Wilson, but I don't know that I've done quite a bit of study and wrote some papers and, and things about Wilson. Uh, he was quite an amazing character. He was born in 1766 in Paisley, Scotland. And um, two parents uh, that were uh, cottage weavers, which was an industry back then before they put it all into factories. And uh, he was, uh, this, this is a little side story here. He was baptized in a Presbyterian church by a guy named John Witherspoon, a pastor. Uh, a year after Wilson's uh, birth in 1767, John Witherspoon uh, emigrated to the United States and uh, took up residency in Newark, where he became the head of the College of New Jersey, which today is Princeton, and later on became a signer of the Declaration of Independence. So the only, uh, the only religious leader that uh, signed that document. Uh, but getting back to Wilson, as he grew up, he became a weaver and uh, he became an itinerant peddler. And uh, he um, started to write poetry and he was becoming quite popular. And people said he's, uh, uh, you know, he's a, he's a pretty good protege of, of Browning. Um, not Browning, I'm sorry, the great Scottish poet. Can't think of it right now. Um, and then he also became politically active, and that's what got him into trouble with uh, uh, with factory owners. He was writing poems and things, going out giving talks about uh, the evils of the, of the mills and things like that. And he found that it was to his advantage if he moved and uh, he came to this country, where he worked as uh, different things. He took up weaving again in his cottage and outside of Philadelphia. Um, and then he started wandering and uh, he went all over. He went up to Niagara Falls, walking the whole way, uh, writing poems and things. Uh, came back um, and uh, was, took, became under the mantle of, uh, of uh, William Bartram in Philadelphia. He lived near him and Bartram kind of took uh, Wilson under his wing. And that's when it took off his love of, uh, of birds. And, uh, he uh, started traveling all around. He traveled all around the country at the time. He ran into some problems where he was a big uh, proponent of, uh, of Jefferson. And 
that got him into some political problems here. He gave a, a speech uh, uh, on Jefferson's inauguration in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, he wound up in a little bit of trouble. He found out that it was best if he disappeared for a while and went up to Bloomfield, New Jersey, where he got a teaching job. And if you read some of his letters about Bloomfield, he hated every minute of it. He hated the kids. He finally moved back to Philadelphia. Things got straightened out. And he started to produce his American ornithology, great work. Uh, unfortunately, um, he got, he caught dysentery. And, uh, and it's thought that he caught it here in New Jersey, uh, uh, chasing after a, a shorebird in one of the marshes on the shore. And went back to Philadelphia and unfortunately died at the age of 47. But uh, uh, just an incredible life, uh, all the things that he did. Uh, another life that we have here, uh, Audubon, Audubon Shearwater. Um, I trotted out my picture of Audubon's uh, Oriole, uh, but it was it was really bad, so I didn't put it in. So I just did just put in this drawing of Audubon Shearwater. Uh, everybody knows John James Audubon. Audubon Society is named for him. Great nature artist, uh, popularized at uh, the nature study. Um, in the, in the mid 1800s. And uh, interesting too, he, um, he was born in uh, Saint-Domingue, which is you know, Haiti, French colony. His father was a French uh, sea captain uh, who served in the French army during the American Revolution and bought a piece of property near Valley Forge that comes into the story later. Um, so Audubon on one of his, uh, Audubon's father on one of his journeys to Haiti, uh, uh, coupled with a, uh, a Creole woman and gave birth to uh, John James. Um, eventually, the father brought John back to France, and his wife actually took to him and treated him, treated him as if she was as if he was her own child. Um, and then, in uh, uh, 1802, I think he came. Uh, he was born in 1785. Uh, his father was watching what was going on with Napoleon and didn't want his son um, to be drafted into Napoleon's army. So he sent him to the United States and put him up in his piece of property that he had purchased at Mill Grove near Valley Forge. And that's where John James Audubon first uh, took up his love of birds and drawing and he's Credited with being one of the first to band a bird, a Phoebe living in a cave near his, near his house. So uh, that's Audubon's story. And another great naturalist of that period, Charles Lucien Bonaparte, uh, a nephew of Napoleon. When Napoleon's brother, King Joseph, had to flee Spain, he, was, he had been installed as King of Spain and then was deposed. Uh, he moved to New Jersey. I think probably a lot of you know that story about how he built a, an estate uh, in, in Bordentown. And Charles Lucien came with him uh, because Charles was married to Joseph's daughter, Zenaide. Now, first cousins, that happened a lot. And then Bonaparte's weren't quite royalty, but I guess they acted like it. But it wasn't, uh, it wasn't unusual in those days for, for cousins to marry. So he married his cousin Zenaid and later on named the genus of doves after her. Uh, some people say because they were like low birds. Uh, so I don't know about that, but he named that after his wife. And uh, he eventually moved back to Europe and became a, a very renowned naturalist uh, there. And then we have, we'll delve into a little bit about butterflies. The monarch is supposedly named after King William III of, uh, of England, William of Orange from the Netherlands. Uh, and you can, I guess, guess how that came about. Um, and then we have the Viceroy, of course, rules in place of the king. Uh, that's, you know, quite a, uh, quite an appropriate description of the viceroy who certainly mimics looking like the monarch um, and doesn't get eaten that way. And then there's a whole spate of other uh, ranks of 
queen, admiral, soldier, butterflies. There's probably some others that I don't know about that you do, but uh, they seem to be into naming things in sort of a feudal order. Uh, that's when they were naming these things. Named for a place, uh, Canada Goose, Virginia Meadow Beauty, Prairie Lily, Marsh Wren, American Oyster Catcher, Northern, Great Crested Flycatcher, named for an activity, things that the bird does. Sometimes the names are kind of uh, similar, American and Oyster Catcher kind of, kind of uh, goes with two of those topics. Mock Northern Mockingbird, Black Skimmer, Skimmer Skims. So that's what they do. Uh, woodpecker and Virginia Creeper. Name for a description or an appearance. So bighorn sheep, blue curls, canvasbacks. And name for pink lady slipper. Looks like that long billed curlew, St. Andrew's cross, and pronghorn, ladies' tresses. All because of appearance is how they got their names. Some are named for a description, the calls or sounds, like Chuckles Widow or Chickadee or Blue Jay or Timber Rattlesnake for the sounds they make. Uh, for the calls, um, certainly everybody knows the wood pee we call. It's one of my favorites coming out of the woods, the spring and summer woods around me. Uh, Eastern Toey Hummingbird doesn't really sing, but people named it for its tongue word. And Shrike comes from a Shriek, uh, which is kind of kind of like their call. By the way, when I lived in Houston, these guys were nesting. There's a fallow field next to my condo complex, and I used to walk in there all the time with my dog. And I had scissor tail fly catchers and loggerhead shrikes nesting in there and things. And we had all sorts of good stuff uh, going on in there. It was a neat place. Then they built over it. So, but then what happened with these? Obviously, red breasted nuthatch, if you look, has a red breast. So, red bellied woodpecker, you know, it's, I don't know. It's, it does have a little bit of a pinkish wash on its belly. Uh, at certain times of the year, but uh, is it its most uh, obvious characteristic? I don't think so. Maybe they could have gotten something that was a little bit clearer. Um, ring neck pheasant, right? He's got a, a really a bright ring around his neck, but ring neck duck, come on, that's not, you know, he's got a ring bill, not a ring around his neck. Oh yeah, screech owls don't screech. But roadrunners do run along roadsides and I don't say beep beep. So most species have two names, an unofficial common name, like Woody Woodpecker, and the scientific name Dryocope that, that we gave it, Dryocopus Walter Lanzeri. Walter Lanzei, sorry. And uh, a lot of people think that scientific names are, are Latin names. And actually, there's likely just as much Greek as Latin in there, and Latinized words from other languages and a smattering of native, uh, native names goes into um, the scientific names of, of animals. So the problem with common names. So in North America, that bird's called a common loon. And in the United Kingdom, it's called a great northern diver. How do you reconcile that? Well, it's got one scientific name, Gavia Emmer. And if you know that, you know that if you're in North America, call it a loon and people know what you're talking about. If you're in the UK, call it a diver. Excuse me, and I'm sure they'll know what you're talking about. So the scientific names have a purpose. They are the one name uh, that an organism is known for the world over in almost all cases. So, the problem with common names, so I'm not a botanist by any stretch of the imagination. I'm constantly, constantly learning, as I hope we all are. But uh, some years ago, you know, everybody goes down to uh, the, the Pine Barrens bogs to see the, the orchids and things. And then just after the, uh, uh, the uh, 
calipogons and stuff are, are done blooming. And there's another plant that comes up, but most of the people are already gone. They've, they've seen the orchids and uh, they're not around. And most of the time I had places like Webb's Mills myself because uh, most people weren't going around anymore. And there's these lovely, large white flowers. They were all over the place. I didn't know what they were called. I tried looking it up in the book. Newcomb's book, it's not listed. Peterson's book, not listed. And Boyd's book about Pine Barrens plants, it's called Centauri. Centauri. Uh, I looked it up on the web. Uh, on the web, one site said it's called Lanceleve sebacea. Another site said it's called Lanceleve rose gentian. Uh, so coming to the rescue, uh, and I and I have a number of older books in my uh, in my personal library and online. I've got the uh, uh, Whitmer Stone uh, Guide to Plants of New Jersey to the Pine Barrens, and um, so. Looking at that as a sebacea diformis, and each one of those, Boyd and the two websites, gave that scientific name. So I knew that that's what the plant was, and I just I just choose to call it Lance Leaves Sebacea. Um, and uh, yeah. So if you get to know a few roots, prefixes, and suffixes, it will help you along in determining what some of these names might mean. The bald eagle. Uh, the English name Heliadus leucocephalus. Um, bald comes from Anglo-Saxon, meaning shining white. It has nothing to do with with that. Um, with my head, um, and eagle comes from the French aigle, from Latin aquila. Uh, and the Heliadus comes from halos. Actually, it's, it's related to salt too. Salt sea. Atos eagle leucocephalus means white and head. So basically, bald eagle is white-headed sea eagle. So here are some of those common roots, prefixes, and suffixes. Body parts, that you see those in a name, you know that uh, Seph or Kef means head, and, and uh, P-T-E-R means wing. And so we have here like uh, Lepidoptera. Uh, literally means uh, scale wing and a lot of the insect orders are named for their type of wings coleoptera and diptera and, and things of that nature um colors uh argent or cyan and so a lot of these come from greek some from latin or um uh, so yellow-headed blackbird we're getting right two of these uh, categories here xantho for yellow and cephalus for head and it's uh, we're doubling down xanthocephalus xanthocephalus for the yellow-headed blackbird and then uh, just some others ensis meaning from the red-tailed hawk the, the type um, specimen came from jamaica so they call it budio jamaicensis coming out of Jamaica. Uh, essence means becoming like uh, uh, answer carol essence, the, the, uh, the snow goose. And with the two double eyes on the end means it's named for someone, uh, Cooper's hawk, you know, uh, a chipper Cooper rhyme, Cooper E, I think is probably more, more correct. Blue jay uh, basically means uh, blue tailed crest head. Uh, Song sparrow means uh, song sparrow singing, singing song sparrow. And like a podium obscurum uh, means uh, hidden wolf foot. Uh, and uh, from uh, sort of the shape of the plants, they related it to a wolf's foot for some reason. Uh, when science meets mythology. Uh, so, Black swallowtail, Papilio polyxenus, uh, Latin for butterfly, Papilio. Polyxenus, the younger daughter of the king of Troy, uh, from Greek words for many strangers. And if you look at the drawing down there, I don't know if those many strangers mean many men or what, but, um, but the question is, why did they name the black swallowtail after this daughter of King Priam? Uh, I don't know 
the sources I looked at didn't quite know either. But uh, we're going to see a few things about mythology here. And uh, you have to understand that the old time, the 17th, 18th, 19th century naturalists, those uh, that were educated, went to schools where they were probably taught in Latin. Most of the books they had to read were in Latin, uh, a good many of them in ancient Greek. And, uh, and so they became familiar with all of these stories, all of the culture of the ancient Romans and Greeks. And they brought a lot of that forward to, um, to their names. So Arethusa um, was a sea nymph, a Nereid, uh, who ran away uh, from being pursued by, uh, who was that? Let me, I have that written here, uh, by being pursued by Alpheus, a river god. And um, he wasn't after her for a botanical knowledge, I don't think. But uh, anyway, she up, uh, appealed to the goddess Diana, the goddess of the hunt, um, to uh, keep her safe. So Diana, Diana planted her in a quiet uh, pond and so just as we see Arethusa orchids growing in quiet marshes and, and bogs, acid bogs and things. Bog asphodel, uh, grows in the same area as the Arethusa. It was named for a plant that grows in uh, Arcadia, the, uh, the sort of uh, rest, final resting place of, of good Greeks. The legend of Alcyon. Uh, her husband, Serex, uh, was drowned at sea, and she was so distraught that she threw herself into the sea and drowned herself. Uh, the gods turned them both into kingfishers, and so our belted kingfisher is called Megacero for Serex uh, Alcyon. And um, since they breed in the spring, when they bred, those were called the days of Alcyon, uh, the Halcyon days, which uh, is an is a expression we still use today for fondly remembered times in our life. So these stories are neat. I, mean, I love looking at belted kingfishers and I love to put them on my year list and take pictures of them when I can, but excuse me, knowing these little stories just adds a whole nother dimension to my appreciation of nature. Uh, the butter, I see, I see, I told you we'd get back to Monarch. Uh, Danaus Plexippus, Monarch Butterfly. So Zeus had a couple of great grandchildren named Danaus and Plexippus. And why they're called that, uh, why they got uh, attached to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, monarch butterfly is a mystery, uh, although some people would say that uh, it's really named for a descendant of Danaus, Danai, uh, to whom Zeus appeared as a shower of gold, and uh, that makes a little bit more sense. It sort of fits with the, uh, the golden color of the, of the monarch. Misnomia. So, Prothonotary warbler, and every one of everybody's big quest bird every year. Um, and uh, it comes, the name Citri, of course, comes from the citrine color of the bird, but Protonotaria was known as the first scribes, was supposedly named for the golden color of their robes. The problem is that the color of their robes were purple. When he found out about it, the great uh, ornithologist and naturalist um, Elliot Coos just said, why? So in my own humble opinion, I probably should have kept that old name for the bird, the Golden Swamp Warbler. It's, uh, I think a lot more fitting. It describes its color and its habitat. Same. Acadian flycatcher. Uh, Acadia is uh, is Nova Scotia, and they don't breed up there. Cape May warbler. Uh, they come through Cape May, but they don't breed there or anything. It's just that the first one was found there, and so it was named for that place. 
sometimes names change. Long-tailed duck uh, was long the, the name of this bird in, in Europe, uh, but up until probably the 1970s, it was called Old Squaw here in North America. And there's a lot of those other uh, duck names, the old hunter's names, uh, bluebills and things like that, that uh, uh, have uh, regular names attached to them. So more misnomia. We have here the Eurasian Golden Oriole. I've never seen one, but I had to steal a picture off the internet. Uh, so when the first settlers came to Maryland, which was settled as a, a, a Catholic colony carved out of uh, the Virginia territory, um, they started noticing this orange and black bird. And they said, oh, that looks like the colors of Lord Baltimore, our, our patron, the owner of the colony, the proprietor. And so they named it the Baltimore Oriole. And of course, that eventually became the name of the famous baseball team. Then in 1973, Baltimore Oriole was lumped with Bullock's Oriole and became the Northern Oriole. So we lost a bird. And then guess what? Some years later, they split it back to Baltimore Oriole and Bullock's Oriole. And by the way, there was just a Bullock's Oriole down in uh, uh, Pittman a few weeks ago. Further, Orioles are, aren't even Orioles, they're blackbirds. The old world Orioles belong to the family Oriolidae, the new world blackbirds belong to Icteridae. It's not over yet. So there's a sampling of uh, the blackbird family restricted to the New World, uh, uh, Altamira Oriole, and Brewer's Blackbird, and, and uh, Brown-Headed Cowbird, and, and uh, uh, Boat-Tailed Grackle, Red-Winged Blackbird, Eastern Meadowlark, and Yellow-Headed Blackbird. I said, but you can ask yourself, but wait, isn't there a blackbird in Europe? Yep, but it isn't a blackbird, it's a thrush like our robin. Hmm, ain't that weird. Isn't there a robin in Europe? Sure, but it isn't a thrush. It's an old world flycatcher, muscicapidae, which comes from Latin words meaning chaser of flies or catcher of flies. But don't we have flycatchers? Absolutely, but ours are from the New World family, the Tyrannidae. So since we got a lot of people that came from Europe early on, they brought with them the things that they knew and the things that looked like birds and animals that they knew back in Europe, uh, they just didn't understand all of the uh, ins and outs of, of uh, relationships between, between birds and animals. And the boot meadowlarks are not blackbirds, or not lark, are blackbird, not larks. And yet the Eastern meadowlark scientific name is Sternella magna, which means little starling. Uh, even though it's bigger than a starling. Uh, so as you can see, there's a lot of confusion about, uh, about naming. There's uh, uh, people, uh, some people take it seriously, but uh, it, it's good to know uh, the names, both common and uh, scientific names of things. Uh, and it helps you to go on your, on your, your life's journey of learning about nature, the, the whole story. That big little uh, confused yet. I'll just stop like this, Egret. So, to sum it all up, Shakespeare, a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. So, whether you have multiflora rose or rosa multiflora, still the same thing, no matter what its name is. And even if you're calling it, that pretty white flower down the block, you can still appreciate it. And of course, Gertrude Stein just said, a rose is a rose is a rose. And that's my program. There's my email. If anyone is interested in contacting me, please do so. And I thank you. Thank you so much.
Um, if you could stop sharing screen and then we'll go, we'll get everybody back. And then if anyone has any questions for Chris, just um, unmute and ask away. Anyone with questions? Actually, I'll here we go. There. Okay, we're all back. That was a great program. Thank you so much. Right, thank you. Questions? Oh boy. That put everybody to sleep. <laughs> no, you still everyone's still here. Okay, it's, I guess that's a program that we all just have to kind of embrace and take in there. Okay, I'm not, I'm just looking, giving another minute for questions. Sure. Okay, people are making some comments that they really enjoy the program as I did. A lot of thanks going on there in the chat. Recording. Sure.